Well, thank you everybody for being here for our next installment of what is becoming the Doug and Shaheen marketing. Let's go deep, discuss things and talk to some really smart people in the process show. And we're delighted that we managed to get Jen Hartman to carve out a little bit of time to join us from what I have now recently learned is the Quad City area. So yeah. uh, Jen, why don't you do a little intro and then uh, Doug, maybe you can, and then we'll carry on. Yeah. Hi, everyone. And, and thank you very much for asking me to be here. I take advantage of every opportunity to talk about public relations uh, and marketing um, with fellow lovers of, of the topic. Um, I, I am the director of public relations and enterprise social media for John Deere. Um, and as you just mentioned, um, our world headquarters where I'm sitting today is located in Moline, Illinois. Um, and that is part of four cities that sit right along the Mississippi River. Um, uh, two cities in Iowa, two cities in Illinois. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Doug, maybe you want to do a little re-intro? Yeah. So uh, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon. And for just over, well, for about 25 years, I was in the advertising business. Before that, in uh, selling supercomputers. And before that, in aerospace. So I have one of the strange backgrounds. Don't ask me to make sense of it. I, I can't really, other than I sure like it. And I've been teaching and then researching and writing a book on complexity and how it affects business or what kind of things we should learn from complexity uh, to help in business. And I'm about, uh, I guess I could say maybe I'm halfway through the first draft. And since John McPhee said you got to plan on four drafts, I think I'm a long ways away. But uh, um, it's really fun because there's really fascinating things that uh, uh, I'm discovering. So. How many pages so far? What's that? How many pages so far? Uh, well, right now, the kind of the, the draft is at like 200 pages, but I've got all the right formatting and, you know, I've got a chapter got title it. for every chapter I haven't written. So, yeah, Jen, what were you going to ask? I was going to, is this your first book? No, it's my second book, but the first okay. book was pulled together blog posts. So I pulled together blog okay. posts and then tidied them. This is the first one written from scratch. Okay. So it's an entire adventure. You know, I mean, right now I'm just trying to get content in, getting back to things like tonality and what do I want, you know, how do I mm -hmm. treat sensitive issues and stuff? Oh boy, that's coming. But yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, yeah, I mean, it's an adventure, but I'm, I'm really loving it because the nice thing about the topic is, you know, some books you write because you kind of already know what you want to say. This one I'm writing because I thought I kind of knew what I want to say, but the more I get into it, the more I discover. And that's what's really fun. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, as most of you know, uh, we try to do these. The, the reason why these are meetups is because we wanted the informality of a meetup, that we're all kind of getting together to have a chat. So they're informal, they're unrehearsed, we can go deep. If you have any questions, please chime in and try to steer the conversation to a place that is interesting to you. Please do that. And then the idea really is to go uh, and, and really get the insights and not be limited by a 20 minute kind of a you know, webinar format where you necessarily have to rehearse it and prepare it to kind of hit all the hot areas. So this one is to just like all of us have that conversation. I'll do a little bit of an intro on me. So I'm uh, Shaheen Khan, I'm part of a consultancy called OrionX.net. Go to that website and see what all we do. And we do a lot of different things and I do even more things than you know it's on the website because it's 2021 and I want to. Uh, so I do a technology analysis on the one end, and then I, you know, I grew up in marketing, so I continue to play CMO here and there, and I am interested in the topic, so I keep track of it, and hence what we are doing here. So with that, let's start with PR. So uh, PR is a big part of this whole situation. It's been highly dis disrupted with social media and sort of citizen publishing, as you know, as my colleague Cindy says. So let's talk about that. So to me, it was kind of have been going through a revolution. So the topics that we are thinking about, and I will list them all so we can kind of have them all in mind and you know, we don't have to go linearly. But is the revolution over? And what is PR these days? Do we even need it? Uh, where should it be placed in the organization to have the maximum impact? And, uh, and, and how are agencies evolving? So any of the above. Let's start, Jen, with you and you know, any of the topics that you may want to speak to. Yeah, let's start with the citizen publishing one, because I think that one's um, um, interesting. And, and 
I'm in a, you know, a role that was actually held for 21 years by my predecessor. Um, when he retired in February of 2020, um, I, I, he and I sat down to talk about how the world has changed in those 20 years. And, and one of those things he brought up was this whole concept of citizen publishing that in the past, if there was um, something that happened at a factory and um, a local reporter heard about it, that local reporter would have gone into her new, his or her news editor, found out if they wanted to do a story, he or she would have called my predecessor to ask him questions, find out what he knows. Ken, meanwhile, my predecessor would have had time to determine what's going on over at the factory, get the facts, what's, how perhaps we want to be sure that information is carried through the media. In today's world, if there's an incident happening in the factory, it's posted to social in a second. There is no time for a PR practitioner in issues management, oftentimes, to have that time to prepare. Or even, you know, in the news media, he would have had, there wouldn't be any publishing until the next day, <laughs> right? The story would have been written, maybe some pictures taken, um, and there would have been some delay even before that reporter could take that to their audience, um, so in today's world, it's all so immediate. Um, I think journalists are under a lot of pressure to be first to market with their story. Um, so whether it's citizen publishing or traditional, you know, journalism and, and, and earned media, um, that speed to market is moving exponentially faster um, and, and continues to move faster um, every day. I keep feeling like COVID, um, you know, I thought, gosh, if once I made it through COVID as a PR practitioner there, there, you know, I, I had done the hardest work I would do. Um, and, and quite frankly, the pace of the world is moving so fast that there really isn't a time to, to sit back, have some lessons learned and, and practice any differently. Hey, Jen, it's Cindy. Um, uh, so it sounds like, you know, the role could be more of crisis communications because you're mm -hmm. reacting. But yeah. I, I do think that the media has a, a place, you know, I, I always wonder mm -hmm. what's the future of media, but they're, they have standards in terms of mm -hmm. truth and, you know, checking sources and things like that. And so I think that's valuable that maybe that citizen journalists will never replace. I mean, people have the mm -hmm. freedom to do that, but there is still a role of media for media, I think. Do you agree? I, I absolutely agree. And and although I would disagree with it's it's not all media that has standards uh. <laughs> and journalistic integrity. But I am learning in this past year and a half to know the difference. Um, and I very much agree with you that there are a number of, of journalists that play a exceptionally important role. So, so when you ask the question about whether PR is still needed, I would say it absolutely is still needed, um, that we can't rely on citizen journalism to tell the story. We are going to need journalists and, and representatives of companies and organizations that are collectively helping share stories, truth, facts, um, and the realities of, of what's happening in the world. You know, one of the things that I have seen is that, uh, especially with startups who are not big enough to really uh, have the pressure to uh, delegate more, that, that especially a senior management startup say, you know, I don't really need PR because I'm just going to call the reporters directly. Elon Musk says that. Well, you know, I think if I, you... I, I mean, he got rid of his whole PR department. Now, you know, he has the kind of following that mm -hmm. allows him to do that. Right. And, you know, and, and various politicians get to that point occasionally. Uh, but I think that, do we see that? Therefore, the PR kind of function isn't needed because the source of the news executives and whoever is kind of managing can go directly to the, the media. 
I, I would actually argue that PR is even more important because of that. Um, that you know, leaders um, heading up great company, you know, companies or startups. Um, that does not mean that they are experts in public relations and communications. And the messaging strategy, the need for consistency, um, the self-awareness of, of how various messages um, might be interpreted, um, the value of, of due diligence and, and practice and <laughs> um, preparation. Um, doing a media interview takes a particular skill set um, that I think PR practitioners can bring to the equation and um, understanding what that journalist might be looking for, what questions they might be asking to ensure that that um, company leader representative is prepared to respond in a way that will shine the, the, the most positive light <laughs> Um, on that company, organization, or individual. I think that's a good segue to like, what is PR these days? Uh, Doug, you were going to say. Well, I was going to ask one further question, Jen, just because I think it's a really the citizen, this shift with the citizen journalism and stuff getting out there. So is it more a vision now that as a PR practitioner, you know that kind of stuff is going to happen? What you have to be is prepared to figure out when it does happen, how to kind of jump ahead. And, you know, what does it get? I don't mean control because we never control things, but help dampen. We, we talk, a, you know? yeah, we talk a lot at Deer and at least in my world about pain tolerance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there is so much information being shared so frequently and so often mm -hmm. that it's inevitable. And, and for a company like Deer, it's inevitable that there's going to be uh, haters out there or trolls or negative stories. Um, and it's, I think that's another p important role for a PR practitioner is to put that in context. Um, and whether it's building a stronger pain tolerance for some of that. Um, but then to your point, Doug, um, being prepared to respond to that in an appropriate manner mm -hmm. to not overreact, to not, um, you know, uh, pivot too much um, or make the situation worse. I, I also am becoming more and more aware and, and thanks to companies like Amazon and Facebook, those companies have some of the most negative stories any PR practitioner would have heard of you know, 10 years ago, right? Um, and yet they continue to be on the top of most admired employers, you know, most admired brands, um, highest performing companies. And I think that's due to the incredible storytelling that they share on such a prolific basis. Um, and, and I think that's the power sometimes of, of a PR protection practitioner as well, is that you can't just always be reacting to negative stories. You have to be building a, a you know, a bank of positive stories um, to help strengthen that brand um, when there is negative stories, perhaps that bear down on you. I mean, I know some that I've been, you know, not, I wasn't directly involved in the PR around it, but in airing media, we had some stuff air on shows that were uh, uh, verboten, and uh, Greg will know about this. But, um, you know, what I've noticed is it's really hard for companies to sort through the, okay, this story came out, but back to your pain tolerance, or kind of to what degree does it matter? You know, that if it, 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 I talk about social media, like starting a wave in a stadium, you know, and when you stand up and go, woo, and nobody else does, you feel silly, you know, <laughs> and then when you stand up and go, woo, and your five friends do it with you, you don't feel mm -hmm. quite as silly, but you didn't start a wave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, takes a lot of work to eventually get a stadium to do a wave. And it's mm -hmm. a little bit accidental. So when these stories come out, to some degree, they can always feel inside the company, like you're a pressure cooker and anything mm -hmm. bad oh my god somebody said something bad about us and there's kind of this weird thing about yeah well that one's going to piddle out but that mm -hmm. one turn into a wave how do we know the difference sir mm -hmm. you know? yeah and these stories live on forever now <laughs> and it goes back a little bit to what we were talking about I, I, before the program started today about you know individuals and and their social media behaviors living on forever mm -hmm. 
you know, we now as, as, as a company have the opportunity to collect our stories into one place, right? It, in the mm-hmm. past, a story would have lived for, you know, the day it was in the newspaper and perhaps lived in someone's home for a bit in a magazine right. or otherwise. Right. Um, but now you can, can get access to every story that was ever told on, on a company or brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I was when I was working with DuPont, we fought forever the problem that there was one study right around 1990 that suggested that aluminum cookware caused Alzheimer's. It was very quickly just proven, and yet even today, a quick search pulls up that story. So it's mm-hmm. like oh, that stuff can last forever, and you're like. <laughs> and what you want to do is make sure that you know the the pot. There's more yeah. positive and fewer negative, uh, right? And right. right. Mm-hmm. So this actually raises the question of who is the audience for all this content? Because, right, I think one of the things that I find in, in, in the marketing work that I do is like you're compelled to write f- for the search engine. And the mm-hmm. search engine wants repetition and wants length and wants nauseating, you know, detail that, that as a person I will stop, like, you know, it just repels me. So how are you going to actually write for human beings while keeping the search engine happy? And, and how do you really game the search engine so that, you know, something that really is minor remains minor? I, you know what? Your question actually raises an issue. I don't know that I've ever really thought through before, which is that another big change in this revolution in PR is the number of channels there are now because channels are so customized to readers' interests, to listeners' interests, to the topics they care about the most, to the communities they've built. And so in the past, a company might have shared one story with Wall Street Journal and got a huge audience to to hear, see, and read that story now it's, okay, we're going to do a particular story to our business audience. Now we're going to think about how that content might work on Instagram. Okay, this story might play well um, in a trade publication. And so I think the way we have to splice and dice stories now to fit the needs of audiences to ensure that it not only resonates with them, it also even just reaches them. And that's due right to how those algorithms work and, and whether or not, you know, those individuals have already shown interest in that topic. So to your point, I think that the work of PR practitioners has expanded, if only because of how many channels we have to consider when trying to reach particular audiences. And right. that, requires, that requires different content. You're not going to share, you know, it's not going to be just one story. It's got, you got to think about what photos, what, (laughs) what quotes, what, how it's positioned and shared. I think like 20 or 30 years ago, PR was really a euphemism, not for public relations. It was really press relations, right? So to your point, the number of like, so the purpose of the PR department was that they were the liaison to the media contacts or or when some 60 minutes reporter barges through the front door, the PR people are the ones who intercept that, right? Yes. So, but now what you're saying with the proliferation of channels, that's, that's probably not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. And the amount of skills, the number of skill sets you have to have because of that, it's, um, you know, I always try to different when I am talking in a podcast interview or conversation like this, I recognize that working at Deer, I have a lot of advantages compared to that startup company you were referring to earlier, sure, right? Right. Um, so I, there are graphic designers, there's agencies, there's, you know, people I can work with on my team or otherwise to create that content. That startup and that CEO may not have all those resources. In fact, they don't, right? <laughs> right. And right. and so yeah. they have to they have to qu- quickly learn perhaps what audience they're most trying to reach and prioritize that channel for that audience. I think one of the biggest mistakes I see with smaller companies and and even nonprofits is they try to be everything to everyone or they try to be on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, (laughs) have media relations search. And it's just, it's just too much. I think, um, you know, some of those smaller organizations with smaller resources need to really identify where their audiences are and invest more heavily in those channels. I think you're right on. In fact, I, in agreement with you, I think the number of different audiences you're trying to reach may very well be 
one of the threats here is that mm-hmm. if you really, you know, if you're a startup and you're just trying to reach your customers mm-hmm. and that's it, and maybe the investors, and then, yeah. you know, that one you already got to handle, then maybe it's fine. But if you are like a big company that has a social presence, you've got political issues, you've got, you know, all of mm-hmm. so that suddenly becomes really complicated. Yeah. I, that's why, I, you know, I'm a big user of Twitter mm. and I, you know, you see a lot of startup and and VCs and others on there. And that's because I think Twitter, it's low cost, right? If you can organically build a community, but you have direct connections with those investors and, and those um, you know, future employees or customers. Um, you can run ideas by others, you know, facing some of the similar challenges that startups might face. Um, so I, th- I think Twitter is that natural place to have those conversations. Well, it, it is a couple of thoughts. One is I, I do agree with you on Twitter. And the nice thing on Twitter is you end up with direct connection to people mm-hmm. and influence. And, you know, even whether they respond to you or not, you still feel like you had a little bit of, you know, sense of them, I suppose. Correct. Um, yeah. Back to your the question, like on startups, too. I think, you know, I've identified for quite a while um, a problem that startups, they're too small to afford the person they need around marketing. Because in, in what I see too often is startups run out and say, well, we need somebody to do marketing. So they hire somebody who's straight out of college um, mm-hmm. and, you know, without any of the, you know, they're going to learn their lessons as they go along, but they don't have those lessons. And to some degree, I've, I've built this idea that what startups need is this like, I mean, some of what you do, Shaheen, kind of a rent a true mature CMO that has Mm. PR experience and, you know, all those things because they need some bits of advice. They just don't need it full time. You know, they need what, four or five hours a month maybe is all. Some of them as much as little as that. Yes. Yes. So I, and I don't know, we don't have that. Um, By the way, Sudi is asking some good questions over in the uh, chat. Yeah. As a segue to that, one of them is really, why are we doing this? What is the objective? You know, is the objective to, uh, connect with the media and get, you know, whatever we want published, or is the objective to manage the reputation of the company? What is the objective? And, and depending on what that objective is, how does our approach to all these channels different? Like if you're going to a reporter, how do we pitch a reporter? As you know, Cindy's asking also, what does the role become? Do you find yourself like, you know, responding, managing media inquiries and requests, or is it like pitching proactive stories? Or is it really working with, you know, politicians? Yeah, that, those, all of the above. I was just going to say yes to everything you just yeah. said. <laughs> um, so how do you focus? Actually, this is the interesting question. He's like, okay, it's that brain teaser. How do you pick where to focus, though? Because there's so many things there. It's hard, you know. I'm actually going to start with one of the last questions you raised from Cindy, and that is like the role of the PR practitioner. I think another big shift has been a an expected role. And Andrew kind of talked through the, you know, what it used to be. Um, the PR practitioner as the spokesperson for the company is starting to go by the wayside. Uh, right. Um, in order for, and par- this co- goes back to a little bit about the question about pitching a story, mm-hmm. journalists want access to the subject matter experts in your company. Mm-hmm. And for someone like Deer, they want access to that CEO or that CTO or that CFO, right? They want to they talk to the person that's heading up the strategy or heading up the, you know, the direction of the company. And in the past, I think, you know, even in, in my role with my predecessor, my predecessor was the spokesperson for the company. And we've since adopted a model that says, you know, journalists don't want to hear from the PR person. You know, journalists want to talk to the person that's behind that new technology. They want to hear from um, the person that's managing the issue that we might be facing. Um, and so I think that's been a big shift and another skill set that P- PR practitioners need to embrace is that not everyone um, is natural um, sp- speaking to the media. So there's a lot of media training that needs to take place and, and preparation that has to happen. Um, so, gosh, that's, a, that's another shift in the profession that I don't know that I've given a lot of consideration to this conversation today. Kind of like, I mean, what I found in as an agency is that 
when people buy an agency of some sort, they're buying the people. They're not buying anything. It's the people. And so, mm-hmm. you know, agencies are known. We know in our business that new business people don't tend to work out very well. And the mm-hmm. reason is nobody wants to talk to the new biz guy. They want to talk mm-hmm. to the people who are going to do the work. And yeah, so I can use a similar, you know, very much a similar. Yeah. similar so uh, Meta is asking, uh, and by the way, guys in the audience, feel free to just unmute and speak if you'd like to. And the, so he's asking, is this because of lack of trust that they want to talk to the source rather than the PR spokesperson? Or is there something else going on? I, I think in many ways, and this is just Jen Hartman's opinion, I think people are used to hearing straight from the source. And we mentioned Elon Musk earlier. I don't want to hear from the person that's managing the information or the communication. I want to actually talk to the person who's, you know, who can give me that. Yes. Right. I don't want the filter. That's one of the beauties. Like I think all of us that are not digital natives, that was the beauty of Twitter when it first came out. It's like you were hearing directly from politicians in the moment or celebrities in the moment. My goodness, you know, President Trump was speaking to us Mm -hmm. directly. Um, And there's a lot of power in that. And I think now having that PR person be a filter for that um, Mm. is not that direct information I think people have become accustomed to receiving in their inbox. Wouldn't you say too? I mean, even even trends like reality TV establish mm-hmm. a sense of what we want to feel the conversation to be. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, even though reality TV is so heavily overproduced, you know, the, with a few exceptions. There's well, that's the problem. problem. You still get this sense of intimacy with them, I think. And I think maybe for what you're saying, I mean, I think the danger is too often it can come out as the company standing apart. Instead of yeah. being with the, you know, with mm-hmm. the reporter, and that's when the reporters go. I mean, I, you know, I didn't do tons of press tours, but I did a few in the old traditional press tour days, and that was the value when you sat down with somebody in yeah. their office and said, "Let me tell you about this," and then they. Uh, uh, now, I do think a big exception to this would be in the event of a crisis. Mm-hmm. You know, you want all those people I, that would perhaps be that direct line of communication or conversation to be handling the crisis. Mm-hmm. And I think PR practitioners play a very valuable role in making sure there's timely, relevant, important, factual information that is being shared um, with journalists or media outlets. So I do think that that value is, I hope, is never going to go away because I think that's a very important role for a PR practitioner to hold. Well, I would expect that for the press, they like that. The journalists enjoy because, you know, in the midst of a crisis, yeah, they'll go look for anybody who'll talk to them. Mm -hmm. But at some level, there needs to be a consistent, I mean, it benefits them if there's a, okay, we're an authority. Here's what we've got to look at instead of, yeah, that's the guy out on the, uh, you know, this guy on a farm found a row that wasn't hoed correctly or, you know, Mm -hmm. or whatever. So, um, no. Hey, can I come back to, I want to, you know, the percentage question is interesting to me because as I think about goals, I think one of the tough things in PR is identifying the percentage of time that's spent um, containing problems, I suppose, or, you know, whatever it is. It's kind of like making sure things run as opposed to the time spent chase, uh, pursuing opportunity, right? Because you kind of have both yeah. what you've described. I hear both things. Yeah. I call it playing offense and defense. <laughs> so, um, that's so hard. I, I don't know. Is there is there a, a pers- is there a recommendation there? Because um, boy, playing defense isn't something you always choose to do. It's what pops up. Um, yes. It's it's putting out the fires as they come. And but what I'm finding, and again, this is with deer. And I think it goes back to my examples about Amazon and Facebook is that the best defense is a really strong offense Mm -hmm. and it's ensuring, but, but that does take um, attention to that and some really purposeful strategic planning around the stories and how you approach those stories and the, um, the the outlets that are going to reach those audiences that are most important to your brand Um, or to your customer base, because at larger companies like Deer, I could spend all day, every day, just managing issues. Mm -hmm. Well, Mm -hmm. 
a kind of gutsiness on the part of the company to be willing to say that area feels unstable, which is the term I'm playing with right now. Mm -hmm. I think that feels really unstable over there, but you know what? That's okay. Let's leave that and focus on going forward because I think that's where we play defense very often is we're like, Oh my God, it's unstable. We better go calm it down. And that's just modern life, you know? And you know, I'm fortunate at Deer that I, we have one integrated team that includes public relations and social media. Mm -hmm. I I don't think those two exist separately anymore. I actually feel for other companies that have a social media group over here and a PR group over there, because I think they are so intimately intertwined. Mm -hmm. And I think social media is one of the strongest offensive plays you can have. Mm -hmm. That's where you can be building, you know, there, I I've had some debates um, with colleagues in the industry that believe that the only value in social is paid social, right? Where you are purposely putting paid dollars behind behind your social media program to reach targeted audiences. I believe wholeheartedly that organic unpaid social is a huge value to a company or brand that can build strong communities and look at each social platform differently and strategically. So, um, for us, having PR and social means, I mean, we have a daily social media huddle and PR huddle where we're looking at what's the world talking about? What issues are people talking about? What is the media talking about? What's, what are those media moments we could tap into or make sure that we're very mindful of so that we don't inadvertently uh, make a mistake or say something on social that could be interpreted uh, as tone deaf? So... Um, I think social media can play a strong role there, as well as, as you all know, making sure that your brand is speaking directly, Mm -hmm. forget being a spokesperson through that John Deere handle, our team can speak directly to our audiences about this is the situation. This is our response to that situation. And this is how we'll share more. I think the key word you mentioned to me is community, that Mm -hmm. if you manage to build a community, Mm-hmm. And I'm like convinced that the future is all about community mm-hmm. and that, you know, every constituent that you touch at all is all part of the same community that you have to manage. But really building that community is also hard, right? You, it, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes again, you get- I recognize for dear, it's not that hard for us. We have so much brand equity. We have we fans, we have strong customer base. We have strong brand affinity. Our, our Instagram feed is, you know, almost a million followers of people that just love John Deere. Well, and you, have a, you have a whole color. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. The fact, having a product that shows off in pictures is a tremendous strength. It is. I think, you know, it, I think it would be incredibly challenging to build a, to build a brand from scratch, like a lot of startups have to do organically. And I think that's where their individual social media presence right. or their work with influencers can oftentimes help elevate um, th- that brand awareness. Okay. So speaking of influencers, we've talked about mm-hmm. PR and social media. We haven't really talked about AR, analyst relations. Mm-hmm. Are industry analysts, you know, what, what, is, what, is, what, do, you, what do you see? How, how do you see they're, they evolving? You know, I think industry analysts and in investor relations you know, we're, ju- we're seeing a big shift in terms of, you know, investment groups and large investment funds. They're also, from a public relations perspective, looking to invest in, in, in brands and organizations and companies that match their values or are, um, you know, demonstrating, you know, strong sustainability efforts, a lot of ESG focused. Lots of ESG. Right. So yeah. I-, I think that there's really a a strong awareness across all brands, companies, and organizations that um, being a good company, (laughs) I mean that in the truest sense of the world with strong integrity, um, with commitments to the environment or um, fiscal responsibility, um, community, to your point, Shaheen, example, you know, community building in the truest sense of the world. um, Those are all very important. You say community building. One of the things I think the companies often overlook is community building within their, I guess I'd call it within their industry. 
you know, that, that, you know, companies these days, since some days the perception is CEOs are swappable. So you take the guy from Home Depot and you put him in front of Dollar General, uh, put mm-hmm. him in charge of Dollar General or the, pick the person from Dollar General and have him run Chrysler or, you know, the, there's kind of this loss within of car people dealing with car people. And I'm not sure what your industries like that would be, but it seems like there's also a real value for the company in focusing on that community of people involved or supporting the community of people involved with all the issues tang- uh, surrounding your product. Mm-hmm. You know, I know my, you know, my cousin in Kansas is really excited about the new farming practices he's been able to, you know, put in, even though he's very conservative, but he loves protecting the streams and, you know, all these kinds of farming practices. Do you get involved with those things since your product also kind of trickles out into some of those issues or? Yes. So again, being at a company the size of Deer, I'm very fortunate that I have some PR colleagues that are actually closer to the products that are, you know, working very closely um, with the technology that's being developed and um, the enhancements and features and benefits of all those products and and the industries we serve. Um, So in my role, I get the the benefit of, of promoting our brand and, and protecting that brand and reputation um, just in partnership with those folks across the, across the organization. So I want to talk about, you know, back to ESG. And for those of you who haven't, you know, caught up with that buzzword is environment, sustainability, and governance. And it's, it's like becoming a requirement for all manner of investment. And people really want some sort of an ESG element. So to me, that's like one of the big trends that is raising the importance of PR. And then when you map that- that's a great point. Right, and when you map that to the technological developments, like I have no doubt you're probably working on autonomous tractors and Mm -hmm. AI here and AI there. And, you know, what's that going to do to the workforce and what's the social impact? Uh, So that to me is a segue into where does PR belong in the organizational structure? That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that that's been fully answered. I think you'd find it very different across the company. Hmm. And I think the PR practitioner adds some value there because that information now, what I love about the, the new focus on ESG or the enhanced focus, I should say, is that companies are now required to your point, it's not optional anymore to make sure that that data is readily available. What are the demographics? You know, what is the diversity of your board? What is the diversity of your employee base? Um, what is the percentage of, you know, corporate citizenship dollars that you're investing in um, sustainability and environmental? Effort, I, right? I believe, in fact, there are like legal requirements for you to Absolutely. report on these now. It's not just yes. like voluntary. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's a, that's a, a, a big part of the work, you know, the team I'm on, but across, you know, our brand and communications team, um, PR practitioners now don't have, (laughs) we're being held accountable in ways that I think is very, very healthy for the function Mm -hmm. Um, that perhaps in ways we didn't have to be before. I think the best practitioners have always um, have been true to, to upholding ethical standards, but I, I actually love now that companies as a whole um, need to walk the talk. It is, it's interesting to me looking at marketing as this whole bit, right? I mean, first, a quick, quick thought back to the where should PR be, which is when I teach my marketing class, I teach the full range of marketing, all the roles, all the you know four P's and this and that, mm-hmm. except the truth is every company puts marketing in certain places mm-hmm. and people with the marketing title don't necessarily do the same thing, which is confusing as heck when people are getting into marketing, when they look around like, wait a minute, what, what's this? But I think PR falls within that question of, boy, you know, marketing is done according to what you as a company find most effective. Then maybe that's what's part of happening with the PR is where do you put PR for John Deere as opposed to for Exxon or as opposed mm-hmm. to for, uh, uh, well, Elon Musk decided where he put it. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, there's some degree of that sense of what's going on here. The other thought I had is with that, with that is that um, the, this issue of uh, ES, uh, ESG, is um, one that is ideal for PR to respond with. 
And I think we get so siloed, people like ad people be like, oh, we should be advertising that. Well, you know, I've done a lot of advertising. It sounds like an issue that's going to just flop in advertising. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to make a clear statement about it that doesn't sound false. One thing, one thing I would love to change, <laughs> if I could like say, one thing I wish was different. That's and cool. again, we talked a little bit about this before the call started, but there's not a lot of tolerance for even companies or brands to learn as they go. Mm. When an issue happens, or you know, let's say there was a, is a company that perhaps does not have the ideal uh, diversity or people of color across their board of directors, let's give them a little bit of grace to get there. You know, we, we, we are in this, we are in such a reactive culture now that companies and brands and individuals are so vehemently condemned right out of the gates, almost in a very unforgiving mob <laughs> mentality, instead of perhaps giving us all some space to learn, understand, you know, so I think what you end up seeing then is brands falsely stepping forward with some promises that maybe they can't back up or taking a position on an issue that when you dig a little deeper, perhaps they don't have all the checks and balances in place, or they're not really walking the talk when you dig a little deeper. I would love an environment where, and I've said this often, like I would love to be able to say authentically and openly, Hey, we may not be where we should be, but we are taking some steps to get there. Yeah. Yeah. We've started and it doesn't happen. Yes. <laughs> like let us get there and let, let's all grant companies and businesses and organizations the chance to make some mistakes. Yeah. Well, and you, know, you, know what that, you know, what helps that is in fact community and authenticity. You're, tr you're absolutely right. It's, it's the best offense. The best defense is a great offense, right? That's absolutely true. But, but, you know, if you've built a community and there's already a bunch of mutual trust and you have a track record within the community, and then you're also authentic and you're also going to yeah. the source. I think in fact, one, what we're talking about is really the reputation of PR and marketing in general mm -hmm. to be a spin engine to right. twist the facts rather than authentically communicate the facts. That to me is like the real issue there. Right? Well, yeah. I don't think there's any choice in today's world, but to be authentic. I think, you know, right. you found and out, again, yeah. yeah, being in social and PR, we, we see this, our team sees this so often where a brand or a CEO or someone in a company will make a mistake on social media and they take them to tap, right? And, and the world is so divided right now. It depends on what side of the coin you're on, right? It, um, yeah, it depends yeah. on, on what people, you know, which team people are on. But um, PR practitioners can be if they are good at their practice and if they're listened to. So the other important thing is if they're heard, mm -hmm. but they need to be that voice in the room that's saying, listen, we need to be honest and forthright with whatever mistake we made or where we genuinely are mm -hmm. and be bold enough to come forward with that versus trying to create a spin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, a, 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 an example rattles out of my brain from Harvard Business Review, good God, 20 years ago, where they were interviewing the head of design at BMW. And he cautioned that he waits a considerable amount of time before it's right for the designers to present to the engineers because the wrong comment back to the designers too early mm -hmm. tracks what could have been a really tremendous design. Um, is there some similar one as well? It's like, and I don't mean to get in the way of authenticity as mm -hmm. much as kind of, how would I say it? It's like a, an intentional process where you have things where you know, you know what, if we say that now, we're just going to get pilloried because it isn't ready. You know, we're weak in these things. But on the other hand, there are, but you do have to do it. So it's kind of a deciding way. That's actually a really good, that's another challenge I good think point, is yeah. that the world is demanding responses immediately. 
That's right. And 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 you're condemned, and it, particularly when it comes to social issues. There's some research out of the Edelman Trust Barometer that found that since 2017, the world is more and more and more looking to brands to solve social issues, or for CEOs to address social issues than they are their own government or their own politicians, right? There's a lack of trust in government and younger generations are looking to brands for response to social issues or to solve those social issues, right? And you see that happen with, you know, um, you know, consumers calling on brands to take a position on any number of social issues or to threaten boycotts against brands that aren't. Um, but the demand for that response to come so quickly, I think, is in competition with the ability to be authentic about where you are. <laughs> because there's this mob mentality of tell us where you are on this topic and tell us right away. Right. I think this is a really insightful and important point that companies and brands are being viewed as if they are governments with the same kind of expectations and, and, and entitlements really, is that if you get to be this big brand, well then by God, you, are, you already signed up implicitly to act this way and that way. And you know, you're answerable to me, even if you don't think you are, right? And I think younger generations are looking to understand where brands' beliefs are. They want to understand where brands' values are. What politicians are they contributing to? Um, what set of beliefs do they subscribe to before I purchase that product, before I work for that company? <laughs> I think that just kind of makes sense of the whole mm -hmm. kind of hullabaloo about brand purpose and brand mm -hmm. values of all of that is that, you know, if I don't think of it, company as a piece of or part of government, then maybe I don't care. Mm -hmm. But if I do, then maybe I do care. Maybe I do want to know what your intent is, not just what your actions. And I would say that corporate America is not quite ready. You see it more with startups, tech companies. They're not quite ready to draw a line down the middle and say, this is what we stand for. Right. right. Because I mean, if you're a, if, That's if you're a consumer, like you, you know, Trump and Biden voters all eat M and M's. I, it, right. <laughs> uh, you don't want to offend <laughs> either either side of the equation, but but there's there's a lot of pressure on brands to take a position. Well, I think and, it's hard, particularly hard because brands sometimes aren't we aren't very good at taking a position on our own products. And I don't know that we should have to take a position. That's my other, you know, yeah, I, I have often said it would be so refreshing if I could just come out and say, listen, to the same point, Biden and Trump voters all buy lawnmowers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. right? And, and we're going to invest in, 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 in work that is supporting our industry. Um, and, right. and perhaps we don't always have to take a stand <laughs> on every issue or topic. No, I mean, what I tell my students is at some point, making a really good lawnmower that sells for an absolutely fair price while you make a profit and pay your employees effectively. God, that's hard enough. You know I mean? <laughs> it's a accomplishment in the world of business, mm -hmm. much less uh, solving overgrown grass in Australia. But, right, uh, right. You know, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of why I like these sessions to be or scheduled for like two hours because we're just getting into the <laughs> interesting part, but we're also at the top of the hour. So, uh, you know, as a way of trying to kind of uh, bring it home, so to say, uh, there are a couple of questions that we should, we should uh, consider. Uh, you know, Mata is asking, given the growing awareness about misinformation and disinformation on social media, and even in some quote unquote actual media brands platform, do you anticipate that in the next five years, people the audience may come to look for and trust official PR versus community mm -hmm. or citizen journalist generated information. Very, very good question. That is a great question. I think it's on that PR practitioner then to make sure that it's consistently backed up by facts. To me, it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity it for is. PR people to go serve that role. Yeah. And, and to be that trusted source of information for journalists. And for the general public, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so I wanted to just summarize some of the key things that I was taking notes on. We started out by talking about how PR is becoming more of a real-time, faster pace, pressure to publish, pressure to respond, be ready. That's kind of one, one thing that 
that mm -hmm. stood out. The other one was that there are just many more distribution channels for the information that we have. And the number of these distribution channels and audiences adds to the complexity of what PR needs to be doing. We talked about PR simultaneously uh, projecting the perspectives of the brands that they represent, as well as managing the reputation of the brands. Uh, we talked about the the need to go directly to the source and that people do not want filtered information. And indeed, the idea of going to the source is more about not having a filter rather than not trusting the filter. I just don't want it at all kind of a thing. Uh, and then we talked about community, brand, authenticity. We just talked about how that could be an opportunity. We talked about ESG. Uh, now, and then the social impact of what brands do and that kind of leads to where PR needs to be in the organization. It needs to be in on what's coming down the pike so that you're prepared and they need to be consulted on what is the social impact of what we're about to do so that your R&D cycle is in fact aware of that from the get-go. And maybe, you know, certainly with AI and kind of unbiased AI and explainable AI and the fact that autonomous, you know, lawnmowers are guaranteed to happen, uh, that kind of puts PR even closer to the R&D than it was before. Yeah. Well, everything you just said, you know, the opening question, I think, and in your, the description of today's session is, is PR necessary? Will we need it? Everything you just said means yes, right? Everything you just said, I think reinforces just how important the PR profession is going to be moving forward. Well, I that is right on. I'm out of here going, oh my God, you know, it's everywhere. It really mm -hmm. does. Yeah. And, uh, it, All it, right. Uh, now, uh, as we said, we're going to we're going to kind of close this, but then the discussion can carry on for those who'd like to do this. But before we sort of formally close it, uh, Jen and Doug, can you let everybody know how to get more of you and where to find you? Jen, you mentioned Twitter. Any other places? Yeah, you can find me. Um, my handle's Jen Allison, J-E-N-A-L-Y-S-O-N. Um, on Twitter, um, I have a LinkedIn page, not very active, so I encourage everyone to go to Twitter. All right, Doug. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm typing some stuff in uh, the window, the chat. Uh, my website is www.duggarnett.com, and you can find me on Twitter all the time. No, um, every now and then. <laughs> a topic. Chat I could have answered it the same way, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway all right if you have questions if the you know or if you want to chat about complexity oh that's right complexity doug is writing the book on complexity after all that's right and i'm at shaheen khan and then on twitter and on facebook and on linkedin um, i'm trying to do be a little bit more on twitter than facebook since they use their user interface. So again, thank you everybody for being here. We're gonna talk about this topic a little bit more because I think it's just have so many different dimensions. And then uh, the video recording of this is gonna be up in the next couple of days and then we'll take it from there. So thank you. We close the formal part of the session now.